It is my honor today to introduce our keynote speaker, His Excellency Ambassador Ibrahim Rasul. Ambassador Rasul is a renowned South African activist and diplomat, known for his faith-driven social and political involvement. One of the founding members of the organization, The Call of Islam, he has dedicated his life to fostering a deeper understanding of Islam and promoting interfaith dialogue, especially in the face of rising Islamophobia. His early activism in the anti-apartheid struggle laid the foundation for his later diplomatic roles, including serving as South Africa's ambassador to the United States. Ambassador Rasul has received multiple awards for his visionary leadership, including uh, the World Congress of Muslim, from the World Congress of Muslim Philanthropists. Through his World for All Foundation, he continues to work on establishing global cooperative relations between various faiths and cultures. His life has been shaped by a lifelong commitment to justice and coexistence through his active participation in the anti-apartheid struggle and leadership in the United Democratic Front and the African National Congress. Ambassador Russell, thank you again for joining us today. We're truly honored. Let me conclude by saying uh, one very important thing. There will be time for a short Q&A um, after uh, Ambassador Russell's talk. If you want to ask a question on every table, there is a little um, QR, code. QR code. Yes, thank you. Uh, so please just scan it, and then uh, when you ask your question, make sure to identify yourself um, by your name and affiliation. And now it's my pleasure to welcome um, Ambassador Russell to the stage. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Good morning. Sabahul khair. Thank you very much. Kareen for that introduction. Thank you very much, Dr. Abdul Al Aryan, for the invitation and for all the logistics. I want to recognize some people that I have understood to be mentors in my life, people like Dr. Samuel Aryan and Professor John Esposito and the many scholars and luminaries who are here today. I'm awed by the idea that I am asked to present to such an audience the keynote address to the Shiwarat series of conferences, this one dealing with Islamophobia. And I would understand it that it is not that I'm invited, but that there is an entire history in South Africa that holds out lessons for a world that is reeling with a multiplicity of bigotries, of pathologies like inequality and poverty that need to be understood. And while South Africa must always be looked at as its example, I do understand the ambiguity about South Africa today. But as I told our ambassador to Qatar, who is sitting here, that maybe South Africa as a further lesson to teach the world how to salvage a revolution that is showing signs of deep decay. So I say that so that we do not get the impression that we are standing with moral purity. We are mired in deep struggles ourselves. The origins of Islamophobia in South Africa is as old as the existence of Islam in South Africa itself. My ancestors started arriving in what was called the Cape of Storms, or Cape Town, in 1658 already, a few years after the Dutch commander Jan van Riebeek had come to establish his refreshment station to serve the colonial ships that was traversing between the colonial centers in Europe and the colonial periphery across Asia and Africa. They were called the Malays of South Africa because they were largely and initially drawn from parts of Indonesia and they were brought to Cape Town as both political exiles who fought colonialism in Indonesia against the very same Dutch 
and as political slaves. Because while what the colonialists wanted from the indigenous population was their land and their cattle, what they required were skilled labor, which could only be brought at that point from the other colonies like in Indonesia. Later they were joined by South Asians and other Africans who were on slave ships. And all of this project of dispossession, of conquest, and of accumulation happened under the fig leaf of Christianizing and civilizing the African population, and particularly also the Muslim population that was growing in Cape Town. Thus was born Islamophobia, the discrimination against the beliefs and practices was so intense that for the first hundred years of Islam's existence in Cape Town, the religion of Islam was banned. Those practicing it were either punished through imprisonment, dispossession, further dispossession, and even execution. And it was Nelson Mandela in his book who wrote that when he thought he was the first political prisoner on Robben Island, he discovered there the tomb of Sheikh Matura, one who was brought to Cape Town and further exiled because of his ongoing activism to Robben Island itself. And so Muslims in that time in Cape Town, in the Cape of Storms, were punished both for their faith and for their ongoing activism. And Islamophobia persisted in South Africa until 1994, because as a new father in 1991 to a daughter, Tahrir, that I had named with so much hope for our freedom, when I faced the Home Affairs Office to register her, as a Muslim whose marriage was not recognized and whose religion was despised in 1991, a year after Mandela's release, I still was forced to register her as illegitimate. And so, this template of colonialism and bigotry was not new. It was being theorized. It was even being eulogized and eloquently captured in the literature of the time because while the conquest of slavery, of dispossession, of racism and Islamophobia unfolded in the Cape of Storms in Cape Town, simultaneously William Shakespeare wrote his play, The Tempest. It was written in the 1600s, but first performed in 1611, effectively rendering that colonial project as normal, particularly eulogizing its civilizing mission that was the burden of the white colonies and the colonialists. The Tempest is a tale of a scholarly man of letters, of science, and of art called Prospero, who was so engulfed in these civilizing pursuits that his brother deposed him from the throne of Naples and banished him to an island that was seemingly uninhabited. Except that it was inhabited by those that were called the unlettered the uncivilized, the masterless, who in their masterlessness are wild, savage, and rebellious. I thought it worthwhile to spend an opening few minutes on Shakespeare's Tempest in order for you to find the connections between what Shakespeare presented in the Tempest as the civilizing mission of white colonialism and the resonance 
that will resonate over the next two days in a conference such as this. Thus, the foundational theme of the encounter is laid of the civilized and the uncivilized, and that it is the duty to teach the wild and masterless other who may be black, who may be Muslim, who may be any other other, how to subject, in the words of the tempest, their libido to discipline, their body to soul, and their passion to reason. Prospero's daughter, Miranda, in the face of the one who embodies the masterless, wild and savage person, Caliban, Miranda chides Caliban who persists with his rebelliousness by saying, and I quote, a bored slave which any print of goodness will not take when you did not, savage, know your own meaning. I endowed you with purposes, with words, which made them known. But your vile race had that in it which good natures could not abide to be with. Therefore was thou deservedly confined to this rock. Unquote. Effectively, the wild, the masterless, and the savage is presented as a threat to civilized society. Whether in today's terms, it is the threat of your Sharia laws on the civilized norms of the West, the threat of your dress code to the freedom of women in the West, the threat of your visible piety to the unspoken faith that is professed. And therefore, this threat to civilized society, this masterless, wild, savage, must be civilized, must be disciplined through surveillance and punishment, must be confined and restricted. In this project, the threat of the masterless savage can transcend even Pros Prospero's fault lines with his brother who deposed him, and they make common cause against, across their fault lines. They make common cause to deal with the threat. Because in their minds, no amount of educating, civilizing, or Christianizing can reduce the threat as Prospero concludes, and I quote again, a born devil on whose nature nurture can never stick. Unquote. The tempest demands absolute domination, subjection, and metamorphosis of the wild, masterless savage. One such metamorphosized wild man who ends up being the gendarme, the former wild man metamorphosized, becomes the gendarme of the other wild men. Whether today it would be the authoritarians, whether today it would be the surveillance state, that man says in another work, and I quote again, O Queen, I must confess, it is not without cause that these civil people so rejoice that you should give them laws. Since I, which live at large, a wild and savage man, and have run that woeful race since first my life began, do here submit myself, beseeching you to serve. Unquote. It is only complete capitulation that becomes the end goal of such a project, whether colonial then, or whether Islamophobic, racism, or any other ism that is there today. It was worthwhile for me going back to the colonial origins to remind us of the crude assumptions that today is hidden 
in a multiplicity of forms of bigotry, sophistication of language to cover it, and threats which are real, perceived, engineered, or exaggerated in order to keep the project intact. Between Shakespeare's Tempest and Dutch Conquest in the Cape of Storms, we can see that all of that was a project to hide dispossession, enslavement, and accumulation, which is at the base of it. It's obscured by civilizing and Christianizing missions that would be the burden of the Western world. But both the tempest and the storm teach us critical lessons that we are dealing with an entire genealogy of which Islamophobia is a sibling to racism, to misogyny, to xenophobia, to anti-Semitism, to homophobia, and other intolerances in the family of bigotries. Of course, they start with the grandparents of fear and ignorance. Fear of the unknown can sometimes be forgiven. Ignorance has a remedy and is no excuse. The children of fear and ignorance would be prejudice and discrimination. The tendency to prejudge what you don't know can be forgiven. But to act on your prejudgment and discriminate is unforgivable. And it is in that that we need to intervene. The step between a fear and acting on your ignorance. The step between prejudice and acting towards discrimination. In the tempest and the cape of storms, white colonialism went out to encounter and subjugate. They went from the colonial centers to the periphery to subjugate, discriminate, and encounter. Today, mobility defines our age. We all welcome the mobility of capital and goods. At the push of a button, we can move millions and receive goods. But we are at best ambiguous, at worst vile, in response to the mobility of people. When people are mobile, we create all kinds of isms and phobias to deal with their mobility, to repel their mobility, and to push back against their integration. Because they are mobile because of endemic crises of our age, economic crises, environmental crises, and endemic conflicts that we have built into the periphery. All of which force migration. And so while the aging societies in Europe want young labor from the periphery, want innovative thinking to sustain their creative impulse, want to appropriate aspects of culture like a ubiquitous hummus all over the world. They balk at accepting the whole person who must leave their identity, their faith, their dress, and the rest of their culture at the borders in order to become, amongst others, French. And so, we create these isms and these phobias for every difference. We dress it up as an anxiety of the unknown, activating the surveillance state against them, sophisticated, sophisticating punishments at every event, and perfecting the policies of immigration as if they are normal laws that we need to implement. When all, all of those things have simply morphed into what today can only be described as mainstreamed extremism. It is mainstreamed because it has occupied the White House. 
It has 30% of the French parliament, and it is the government, for example, of Hungary. And it is that power differential that can give legitimacy and can give power to the project to discriminate and dominate the other, whether it is the Muslim other through Islamophobia, the black other through racism, the Latino other through xenophobia, the woman other through misogyny, beyond the fear and anxiety because these place a burden on victims. When you call it a fear, a phobia, you place the burden on the victim to prove that they are not fearful. They are not threatening. It is the double burden of the victim to survive your discrimination and to prove to you that they are not so fearful that you have to discriminate. While giving the perpetrator the right to unleash an irrational response to what they claim not to know, a hatred and an aggression against what they fear, and the power to legislate in order to marginalize and confine. The Muslim other in today's world has special treatment because almost 10% of every Western country is composed of the other. There are no longer any monocultural phenomena in the West. 25% of the global ummah, the Muslim community globally, find themselves in conditions of being a minority. The Muslim heartlands continue to produce migrants and exiles because it has been given the right to a triple bypass, a bypass of democracy, human rights and freedom. And there is manufactured outrage that constantly enforces the idea of threat, rebellion, and conflict. But Islamophobia is no longer simply a Western phenomenon. It has taken root amongst the big minorities of Muslims in India, in China, in Myanmar, and other places. In all of these, they are, whether in the West and the East, they are confronted with all manners of populisms, of mainstreamed extremisms, and have learned, all of them have learned, that they must exacerbate and exaggerate or invent the threat of the masterless savage. And they even must create a litmus test to prove to the victim of Islamophobia, in this case, that they must pass a litmus test of whether they belong in civilized society. And so the victim of Islamophobia is confronted with something that may not have been front of mind in their imagination, the litmus test of another victim of bigotry, the LGBTQI+, for example, whose marginalization is weaponized and instrumentalized to prove that one other victim of bigotry, Islamophobia in this case, that you do not belong if you do not accept entirely to the T whatever we stand for. And so two victims are pitted against each other, the one weaponized in order to oust the other. And we need to understand that ours is not, as we learned in South Africa, the one to make one victim the perpetrator against another victim, but to harmonize victimhood so that we stand up confidently against all kinds of bigotries. In South Africa, Islamophobia has evolved over 350 years, as I said. In colonial times, it was Islam and the Malay community 
that were the great integrators for those who were enslaved, whether from Africa, South Asia, the Khoi and the San, or the Muslims, those who were conquered, whether they were the tribes, the Qusa and so forth, or those who were marginalized. If what was done was done in the name of Christianity and Islam was a major victim, then maybe Islam is the banner and the antidote to what we were experiencing. And therefore you will find all shades of people, all ethnicities of people under the banner of the Cape Malays, the, the original Muslims of South Africa, because Islam was the integrator, not the one who perfected exclusionary practices. In early apartheid times, Islam as a faith was not organized enough because everyone was simply fighting for the survival of their mosque, for the preciously held freedom, so-called freedom, after the banning and the unbanning of Islam. They did not have the sophisticated wherewithal to develop a language and a toolkit in the face of apartheid. And they did not have the cohesion to resist and confront apartheid because they were often between the impulses of co-option on the one hand and confrontation on the other, of passivity to keep what you've got and activism to fight for all. And therefore, individual Muslims had to almost get out of the religion and join the liberation movements in various ways when they connected the dots between the multiple crimes against humanity. The dots that they connected that they were discriminated against both as non-white or black and as Muslims and that there was a common perpetrator. And so it is not surprising in the annals of South Africa's anti-apartheid struggle that you find that Nelson Mandela was in prison for 27 years, but in the cell right next to him was Ahmed Katrada, jailed for 26 years. That Steve Biko was tortured to death in the police cells of apartheid but so was Imam Abdullah Harun. That Oliver Tambo was leading the liberation struggle for 30 years from exile, but next to him was Dr. Yusuf Dadu. And so this connection of dots between the multiplicity of bigotries that were faced and the overall project of domination and dispossession meant that there were individual Muslims who stood out. But in the final stretch against apartheid, Muslims seemed to find their true north. Because they now developed a language of justice that transcends religion, race, and ethnicity. They found an organizational form that was comfortable how to be Muslim and insert yourself into a broader struggle against apartheid. How to resist Islamophobia when you are Muslim, but also racism when you are black. They found the formula, the vehicle for partnerships like the United Democratic Front, in which you could be who you are while joining with a multitude of other victims of apartheid. And they found common cause in the shared oppression that was unleashed. And so, Bertolt Brecht, in a play called Galileo, uses this wonderful line when he says, unhappy is the land that needs a hero. Unhappy is the land that needs a hero. Heroes and heroines do not emerge where there is happiness because they have nothing to fight for. Sweden will produce science Nobel um, recipients, literature recipients, but never peace recipients. 
That's for countries like South Africa who had four. Because so messed up we are and so unhappy we are. So in the face of such unhappiness, we are called to heroism, not always martyrdom. Because it is more worthwhile to live your cause than to die for your cause. Because living for your cause requires principled clarity, strategic vision, and tactical noose as you proceed. And so I end by saying the heroes we need today are those who can find the anti-human in the anti-Muslim. Those who can avoid the temptation to Muslim exceptionalism so that we can build bridges to other victims as well while resisting the Islamophobia against you. Those who can recognize common pain, common empathy, and common cause with other victims and not denigrate by implication their suffering as blacks, their suffering as Latinos, their suffering as, um, as, as, as other victims of bigotry and domination. And who can build out of shared pain in a mighty solidarity, a mighty solidarity that confronts the same architect of every ism and every phobia that the world is visited upon. And so, three prophetic examples jump up in the face of Islamophobia today and bigotry as a whole. The one is construct the ark. Take even the antagonistic creatures onto one boat and negotiate a nervous peace as you confront the storm and the tempest and the hurricane. The second one is confront the Pharaoh when you have enough cohesion the victims of the Pharaoh don't have to be good. They don't even have to promise that they will be forever good. But the victimhood gives them the right to be liberated. And finally, to engage with coalitions of virtue, Hilful Fudul, in order that we build the ability to make common cause with others. Thank you very much.